Film Study, an All-American Universe podcast with Lexi. I'm Lexi, and I'm so excited to have Spencer Pacinger on the pod. As we all know, because we watched the show, he grew up uh, South LA, attended Beverly Hills High, and then went on to have a career uh, in the NFL with the New York Giants, and the Dolphins, and the Jets. Uh, and the Panthers, so many teams, really cool teams. I love all those teams. Uh, and then he transferred over and into the entertainment industry uh, where he told a story that's based on his life. So excited to he- have you here uh, and to, to get started. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I mean, if you want to start, do you want to do you want to lay up how we kind of like had this star cross interaction? <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, it was completely <laughs> random. We were just talking about this. I was actually coming from a conference. We love we love Black people on this show and in real life. <laughs> so I was actually attending a conference, uh, the first ever conference for Black people in this field called industrial organizational psychology, because that's my field. Uh, so I was at a conference, and you said that you were doing two speaking engagements. So both of us were like <laughs> coming from like yeah. really, I think, involved activities yeah. for work and then we just randomly i randomly happened to see him as we're in the line and it was actually actually we we're starting to board and like that's what that's what happened yeah, i am one like of those people that get, like, gets in line before before boarding because i'm like i just want to get yeah. on the plane <laughs> same as you, so as you really can see cool. like my my mind my mind was like like i said my mind was mush after doing these two <laughs> speaking engagements and was like wanted to get home, get in my bed, the whole thing, and all of a sudden, like you walk up and you're like, "Has anybody told you you, you look like me? Spencer Pacinger?" And I was like, "Yes, because I am Spencer Pacinger." <laughs> and it was it was such a funny moment. And then, uh, and I know my number was called. I ended up walking on the plane, and and it was just cool because I'm I'm in Atlanta, not expecting to like know anybody, and I'm just, I still don't think people like know what I look like outside of the show yeah. and whatnot. So whenever like a moment like that happens, I'm always like, oh, wow, like this is this is cool. This is crazy. So it is thank you for it, approaching it, me because now look, a month later, here we are. Of course. And it was so random for me because I like it again, like this happened in Atlanta, like not in L.A. Mm, and exactly. so it was really I was just like, am I should I say this? I don't know. Because I was also just like a, coming off of like two days of a conference and it was like really crazy. But yeah, yeah. it was, that was oh, really awesome. cool. That was really cool. So thanks for, <laughs> thanks for saying it was you. And like, cause I know sometimes not, and it's like, it's understandable. Some people, some people are like, oh no, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'm, really a ter- cool. I'm a terrible really liar cool. anyway. So I feel like <laughs> if I would have said I, it's not me, my face would have definitely shown it was me and you would have been yeah, like, oh, like, this guy, like, 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 uh, you didn't have to lie about who you are, you know? So. I get it. I, just, I get it. And I you were so down. <laughs> and you were so down to, to come on the podcast, uh, which was cool, which was cool as well. But at first I wanted to ask just like, how are you doing? How's your family? How is everything? I'm doing well. Um, it's sort of the different category. So I'm I personally, I'm doing well. Uh, I've been off social media for like a month now. I wanted to do a cleanse, um, mm-hmm. cut out a lot of like bread and sugar and all those all those evils in, in the diet and whatnot. So um, I've lost a bit of weight starting 2024, mm-hmm. which always feels great. Um, working on a handful of projects that are various stages, both unscripted and scripted. My kids are doing nice. amazing. I have, I have two kids, a six-year-old daughter named Cairo and a four-year-old son named Madden. Um, they're on spring break right now. So this is like, this is ground zero day, day zero of spring break. So after this, me and my wife are going to just figure out something to do with them every single day. Um, and then yeah. you know, they're, they're doing great though. They're, they're becoming each other's best friends, which is always good to see and, and feel. That's um, amazing. And then my wife yeah. is, my wife is doing amazing. She's growing her business. She has a, a black owned business called post 21. Um, it's on her website. I mean, it's on her Instagram page, my Instagram page, uh, but it's a really dope marketplace that celebrates black creatives. So she has about 70 vendors on there and, and they have just so many different cool uh, curated products that she sells on there. So, um, you know, we're, we're doing the parenting thing while also trying to like build our own businesses both together and separately. Uh, so, oh, yeah. yeah, but yeah, we're, we're in the throes. Of That's amazing. Right yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's really cool, and I love that you're like j- trying to find something every day uh, to do to do with the kids. Understand that. I mean. 
you know, a lot too. Yeah, um, I'm glad be. that your family is doing well. I also wanted to talk about uh, before we get into all American. I'm a huge NFL fan, <laughs> and the NFL mm. draft is around the corner. So, do you have a player right now that you think comps to you in the draft? Honestly, no. I've been so removed from like following specific players. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if it's a sign of me just getting older and not con- and maybe not even connecting to the the current players, or you know maybe I've just stepped so far away from like following the day to day. I just more so follow like teams in general. Don't have a favorite mm-hmm. team. Don't have a favorite player. And I've kind of always been that that person. Um, you know, everybody yeah. has you know the handful of favorite teams growing up. I was like didn't really have that. I just knew. I knew free agency was a a thing growing up, so I was like, "Oh, mm-hmm. Randy Moss is here," and then he went here. So now I'm by proxy a fan of this team because Randy Moss is there. Mm. You know, so never yeah. really followed players um, in terms of like finding a player that has like a good comp to me. Uh, you know, it's it's tough because I'm a linebacker by heart, but mm-hmm. you know, I'm always I'm always looking at. Just the cool players, the, the cool players that, you know, the Caleb yeah. Williams of the world and, the you know, shout out to Oregon to, to the Bo Nixes of the world. So, um, yeah, I'm just I'm just hoping I'm hoping these players understand coming into it, understand that they're coming into a business. Um, they kind of felt that over the past couple of years with, with NIL and transfer court and all that, that they can actually you know take a chunk out of these teams because. The way free agency is going, the way the market's going into the future, I heard even Caleb Williams is asking teams like for a percentage of the team, which whoever team it goes oh, to. Oh wow! So, um, if if there are players that are like me out there, I would like for it to be from a sense of like business acumen and mm-hmm. off the field acumen, not necessarily can you tackle can you tackle well, can you catch a ball well, or whatnot. Like go in knowing what you want out of these organizations because they're going to get every single ounce of blood, sweat, and tears out of you. So make sure it's a mutual contract. Absolutely. Absolutely. I could not agree more. Um, My favorite team is the Ravens. Uh, So obviously I'm a big Lamar Mm -hmm. Jackson fan and he's a player. I think that also was in the news pretty recently for like doing things his way and like that, you know, the system, the business aspect of the system, not really, uh, not really appreciating it. And finally got done, but yeah, I'm, I'm so pro <laughs> player, so pro player. So I yeah. get, I get that. And that's big, actually really, yeah, really great advice. Big, big fan of Lamar. I just want Lamar. If he, if he, if he hears this, if he ever sees this, like, yo, you got into the league because you are a phenom. Like, do not forget that. Mm-hmm. Do not do not convince yourself that you need to throw the ball 40, 50 times a game to, like, get an approval rating right. from somebody. Like, you got into the league. You He won the Heisman, right? Didn't he win the Heisman? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You won, the, like, you won the Heisman. You got into the league. You're an MVP because you know how to run the ball faster than arguably anybody else besides, like, Cheetah. Like, use your legs yeah. more get wins nobody cares how you win just win so i'm a big fan of lamar i just want him to especially like, in the playoffs especially in the playoffs i love you lamar. Legs are why he is the goat exactly exactly yeah <laughs> love you yeah. lamar yeah run more <laughs> i know <laughs> yes yes i agree i agree <laughs> um that's really that's really I'm thinking about I'm still I just like was zoned out for a second because I was just like wow we really lost in the playoffs but it's fine man, man. okay don't, six times we ran but it's all right that's about that I, that game was frustrating it was it game was, was <laughs> but it was shifting into a fictional fictional game and congratulations on a hundred episodes number one for that feat in today's entertainment industry where streaming has, you know, really reduced the number of episodes per season that we see and, you know, not renewing a lot of shows, especially a lot of black shows uh, for a majority mm-hmm. black cast uh, and, and crew and creatives to like accomplish the speed of a hundred episodes is amazing. So Love we, that. Had, we had, um, we had our hundredth episode celebration this past weekend, um, and it was really cool because we rented we rented out this really dope space in downtown LA, um, and 
and we had past actors who were on the show. We had past directors who was on the show, DPs who all came to play with us over the past, you know, six years. And it was just really, this really cool, like seeing a full ecosystem in effect, you know, be, mm-hmm. because NK is who she is and, and the type of person that she is as a creative and even a mentor, you know, you've seen writer's assistants become staffing, have staffing jobs on her shows and other shows. You've seen assistants, like office assistants, work their work their way up to direct episodes of All American. You've seen the cast members, various cast members, go from this being their biggest thing in the industry, their first try or whatever, to be able to direct episodes. So it, NK has created this really dope thriving ecosystem of if you do good work for her, if you do good work for the show, no matter where you are, you can stick and move in directions that you would want to go within the show. So there's a there's a lot of vertical movement within All American, which we're proud to say we've been able to foster. Uh, again, hats off to NK for bringing that up for for fostering that type of environment. But you know, being there six years, a hundred episodes, um, seeing how the the actors have grown into like professionals, into adults, into people that are are you know potentially at the top of their industry specifically even in this genre you know all american when it started out we were just the lowly show about a young black kid you know kind of straddling both worlds on a network that was primarily you know superhero dramas action dramas right and and now you look over the past couple of years we've been we've been the cw's number one show both on on their streaming app and on network and then when we go to netflix we're usually within those top two or three spots uh, for weeks on end once we drop. So, you know, having that having that celebration over this past weekend just really allowed me to kind of just sit back and think like, wow, like this is this is not a dream. Like we really we really did something here. Like we we created a moment. Yeah. We created an energy and and I always think whenever All American, you know, does his final bow and these actors go off and, and do their own things and direct more things and star in the you know the rom coms or the Marvel universes and whatnot. Um to know that we were sort of like an initial spoke in their will is something mm. I'll never take for granted. So, yeah, yeah, and I love how you mentioned that it's like an ecosystem. I've never heard it described like that before, but it is very true uh, that it's like provided a lot of different opportunities for so many people, even you. And I have a question later about like how I was getting into writing uh, as I know that you were like a consulting producer for like your piece of the story, but like even you going into writing uh, in this genre, that was really cool to see. Yeah, absolutely. Should, should we talk about it now? Or do you... Yeah, yeah, we could absolutely talk oh, about yeah. it now. Yeah, I mean, I got into this industry wanting to write. That's that's how I fell in love with it, with outside of going to the movies and and falling in love with story structure in my own unique way of, you know, in the NFL, uh, every off day was Tuesday. So, mm-hmm. you know, you're your most beat up, tired. You're not really going out, walking around, partying like that. You're like laying on the couch, pretty much licking your wounds because you essentially went through a car crash, you know, 48 hours right. prior. So what I would do is I would just go to the movies every off day and see maybe one or two movies at a time. And I just started absorbing story structure um, just by consuming multiple movies. So it didn't matter the genre, runtime, how long it was, how far away it was from where I was staying. Um, I remember where, you know, I drove, I think I drove like a half hour, like 45 minutes to go see Moonlight when I was in Florida, just because I I heard about this like really dope film that wasn't getting much play around the country. So um, yeah, it was, it was that that brought me into this world to the point where I started just wanting to understand how do you write a dope scene? You know, I'm looking at my favorite scenes in, in Hollywood. I'm like, wait, how did they write this? Maybe there's no dialogue here or how are they infusing the music within it? You know? Mm-hmm. So I ended up writing, finding screenwriting books, YouTube videos, and just downloaded final draft and just started teaching myself how to write stories in that structure. Didn't think that it was going to get me anywhere. It was just a hobby of mine. Uh, and then that quickly became something that, I found out post game, you know, we're, we're playing against the Buccaneers and the Jets and all these people flying back from some of those games. I found out mm-hmm. screenwriting was the only thing that could like bring down my adrenaline levels. It could make me not think mm-hmm. about the game and calm yeah. my body, like literally calm my body down. Um, so I was doing that for years, for about three or four years before I sent, you know, my stories to anybody. And 
that sending my story to one of my good friends who had a good friend that sold in the unscripted space, you know, the first night that we actually met and we're talking about, oh, it's interesting, you, you know, you're in the NFL and won the Super Bowl, but you're still teaching yourself screenwriting. This is weird. We didn't realize having that conversation while also talking about growing up in LA, uh, both having played for our high school teams um, and repping LA, even though we both had two different experiences of LA, we were mm -hmm. beginning to turn the wheels on what would become the original story for all Americans. So, um, wow. you know, getting my consulting producer credit on all American uh, was cool at the time. I didn't know like what it meant or whatnot. Um, I just told them from the start, from, from day one, I want to learn this industry as a, as a creative. So if I can sit next to the people that are doing it, that's how I'm going to learn this industry. And being on the show, especially, you know, really thick those first couple of years, I was able to sit next to NK and understand her story structure. I was able to sit sit in the writer's room and I still live, I'm, I'm still in the writer's room, you know, almost weekly, still working on the stories, you know, and even in season six, we just wrapped up uh, our season six finale, essentially. But yeah, it was almost like trial by fire. I didn't I didn't have formal formal uh, like, you know, drama school or film school um, acumen behind me. But even when I attempted to apply to film school, everybody on the All-American cast and crew were like, you're stupid. Like, you already have a show <laughs> on the air. Just be in the writer's room as much as possible. Be in the offices. Be on set. And you're just going to naturally absorb what you need to know. Go out and still read books, still learn, still read scripts and all that. But use these first couple seasons of All-American to be your film school, which I did. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Do you have a like particular, I don't want to say like method of writing, but do you have a like particular spot where you feel like you can get your most script writing done? Like it's like this spot um, or like this, because I noticed you, you said like traveling yeah. and like maybe like coming, like flying back. And I, I, I have both been in situations where I've seen and heard from writers that have a particular spot that they love and also like for myself yeah. like writing on a plane is so easy so I'm just so curious if like you have a particular spot few a few spots like where I'm sitting right now I'm, at, I'm in my home office um mm -hmm. I'm I have curated it and, I, and I'm since like going through an office sort of revamp to curate it to help bring out those type of stories where I'm adding another hey. storyboard in my room and you know, I recently got my grandfather's, my grandfather passed away a couple of years ago, but I recently got his like old stereo system. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, like resituating this office to be that for yeah. me again. Uh, yeah. So I love, love writing at home. Uh, I love writing. I actually go to Soho House uh, every now and then, right? A lot of people say you can't really get work done at Soho, but I, that's not the case. <laughs> I can always find a corner and plug in for like six hours. Um, and then also, like you said, on the plane, like, you know, they're, they're like scientifically, they say there's you're able to like get more thoughts out on plane because like the air is thinner up there and it just allows for something really in your mind to like unlock to where like you you should want to like put pen to paper or write something instead of consuming things. You It's better to create things in the air. So I love writing on the plane. I love writing on the plane. I also love watching movies on the plane. I think mm -hmm. I think watching movies on that little like seven inch screen is Outside of like going to like an IMAX or a traditional theater, to me, it's the second best place you can watch a movie because you know, you, I never do internet on the phone, on my phone. I never look at my phone. Mm -hmm. I turn it off. It's like the only place in the world where I know I cannot look at my phone for three hours. So yeah. I love sitting on an airplane with that seven inch screen and going through like old school rom-coms, like you know, sleep is in Seattle or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. I like watching the older films because I know I'm just locked in. Like nobody's yeah. distracting me. Here I am locked in on the screen. And those I are love places it too. I love you to got to, like, you got it to the inches. I love it. Exactly. Like it's, I'm telling you, like, I think I've measured it too. And I, I, I don't like, I'll either watch movies. I will know I'll never watch like in my free time. I'll watch the old school blockbuster classics mm -hmm. or I watch some like documentaries or whatnot. But, uh, it's just such a fun place to write and to consume yeah. movies is like your, your little capsule of an airplane. Yeah. Yeah. I also heard you talking about music. How important is like music and curating maybe a playlist or to your, to your writing? I think it's paramount. Um, I mean, any, any story you're, you're, you're writing or uh, that I'm writing, you know, 
there has to be a soundtrack with it. You know, I'm currently yeah. writing a, a film that I, a film that I pitched to Heartbeat towards the end of last year that they they came on to produce, mm-hmm. um, set in the late '90s. So mm-hmm. myself being a child, a product of the late of the '90s, understanding that as a kid we were just doused with like the best R and B and the best hip hop and all these different areas of the country were converging at the same time for the first time ever where like Atlanta was becoming a sound. Miami was com- becoming a sound in the early 2000s, like like even a little bit earlier than that. But as a kid, 11 year old, 12 year old kid consuming all of that, now that I'm writing a film set in that world, it has to start with the music, you know? Yeah. I, I'm, I, think, I, I think Jordan Peele said, I don't know if it's like directly from him or he got it from somebody else. He's like the difference between a comedy and a drama or a comedy and a horror is the music mm-hmm. and when you think about it it's like oh shoot that makes sense you know you can, yeah. you can put some walkie stuff behind a murder and like laugh or you can put some jury stuff behind a murder and be like yeah this fits and so that's so uh, true <laughs> music is paramount music mu- music is paramount for me i'm always thinking about when I write, I try to put the specific song I want playing in that moment there and then fix it down the road if we get to that point. But yeah, it's paramount. You have you have to have it in there. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. What were uh some of the songs that you had picked out for the episode that you wrote of in All American? I believe it was four sixteen. No, uh, four seventeen. Seventeen. I know it was one episode yeah. up. I'm typically good with the history, and I'm like, ah, one episode off. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't pick. So, so luckily, luckily, my the one song I picked out towards the end when when Spencer had the the speaker box. Um, um, I'm forgetting. Uh, it's the the jazz number that that we found. I could I could find it yeah. and send it over, but um, that was a song that I had. It's at the very end of the of the of the show where. You know, Spencer and Liv are essentially realizing, like, hey, yeah, things have changed a little bit, but like, we're still who we are to each other. So let's yeah. like stay in that energy instead of trying to focus on how different we are now. You know, we're always yeah. going to be connected. That was essentially the theme of the show. But you know, I think it was a, it wasn't a sentimental mood. Uh, I'm spacing about it, but having Madonna Wade Reed, who is our music supervisor, me and her became really good friends on the show because of music uh you know off the off the offset one day um i went to see an artist i think it was at soho house actually and an artist that you wouldn't think i would conventionally like and whatnot but i'm in the i'm in this little room listening to her set and i think it was uh, cali uchis and Mm -hmm. i see madonna like sitting up front so when she walked by i go hey she looks at me she goes wait, you like this type of music? I'm like, oh yeah, this is this is my jam. Like, I like, I like right. it all, you know? Like, I, if it's good, I, I like it. Um, and so from there on, we've gone to like concerts together. She's given me tickets to shows. I've, I've put her up on artists. We were just talking at the, at the 100th anniversary how I was making fun of her that she didn't know who like Cleo So was. Yeah. Um, so it was just like, I've, I've, because me and her have had such a great kinship because of the show, like me picking the songs for it, I was like, you know what I'm, you know what I'm thinking, Madonna. Like, mm. I don't need to give you examples for like what this moment needs to be, because we are like kindred spirits in that. Uh, it's it's That's a amazing. lot of talking about. Yeah, it's it's you know when we have when we go through those concept meetings and even the music meetings, you know, each scene has its own emotional beat. You know, how are we ending each up each scene. How is it up? Is it an upbeat or is it downbeat? Is it unconcerned? Mm-hmm. Is it is it anxious or whatever and madonna's just a beast at being able to pull those moments um musically sonically out of the show uh, i think yeah. she does a really good job using using uh, uh music libraries and being able to give artists like especially like artists coming up all america has been a really dope show for artists coming up helping them get just another shot on their journey so a lot of that does have to do with madonna's ear and and skill set honestly yeah yeah there's a lot of great music moments on the show and i agree there's so many there, there's there's artists that like uh, the, 
I know I do this and I'm sure like a ton of other people do this as well but there's always just like people asking in the comments like on YouTube if there's a C they're like who is this artist where can I find them <laughs> it's usually <laughs> because they're up and coming artists that their music isn't even widely available so it's just like it's just like in the scene of the show and then people try yeah. to like shazam it later and then figure out figure out who it is so there's a lot of good I think artists that I've been exposed to and like the rest of the fans have been exposed to because of like all of the hard work that Madonna does for sure so that's really that's cool still, to hear I, I think I don't know if she makes them public but at the end of every season Madonna does a playlist yeah she, does, she it does it like every week she'll she'll yeah, post the, the songs okay, from perfect. the show yeah yeah and it's it's always and, always this amazing sort of eclectic bunch of artists which is really cool at the end of the season, she she takes all those lists and compiles them into one playlist that she's like, here, here's season five, and you just have like, yeah, just we gotta we gotta beg her to make that public, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'll talk to her, I'll text her, I'll text her, and be like, yo, <laughs> like, 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 make it go live, <laughs> please. We beg, we beg, I beg. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. I think thinking about it, and then we can, I think shift into all american in a second but <clears throat> i wanted to ask you about your other projects as well uh because i know you, you have some short films um i know there was like uh you know, like you said sort of like documentary style and also just like short films that are like fiction yes. based and things like that and so i wanted to hear about panorama and shortcut panorama and shortcuts and like where oh, you were yeah. in that process and like maybe what you learned from absorbing all of that information and learning that you took from like the all american set into these other into these other ventures with these short films yeah, you know, I, I'll start off with shortcuts because that was that was a project that was that was born just by being on set, you know, for ten hours a day those first two seasons. I'd, I'd say first season and a half or so. Mm -hmm. um, that was something where I never I never thought I'd get into directing. Um, producing comes naturally to me. Uh, being able to just put pieces together, writing is is what brought me into this industry and, and what made me fall in love with this industry. But directing has always been this sort of like I'll get there when it, when it organically is time for me to get there. I don't want to force it. So, you know, I had, I had a story in my head uh, about a, a story, a story that I actually went through my last year playing when I was, a, when I was a free agent to, for part of that year where my barber vanished. You know, I, I went into the barber shop. Nobody knew where he went. His, the people Whoa, that, what? yeah, the people that like went, I mean, that owned the barbershop with him or I guess like rented the barbershop with him didn't know. They were like, oh, yeah, wait, we, ha we haven't seen him in like two or three months. And I'm like, do y'all not think that's weird? And exactly. they were like, they were like, oh, yeah, kind of. But at the end of the day, they were both being like, well, if you need me to cut your hair, I'll cut your hair. Like they were trying to get like $50 off of me instead of this thinking about crazy like, because a relationship partner. between a man and his barber is exactly. like set or a person in their barber. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. I took that and I remember like, you know, I know how to cut my own hair uh, and I know how to make it, I know how to have a neat haircut, but I, you know, you want somebody to make you look as best as you can. So yes. for a young black man, a barber is paramount in their appearance and their confidence and how they present themselves in the world. And when my barber vanished, you, as a black man, you don't just go to another barber, you know, right. you, you try to figure it out. Or, and if you have a barber, you, maybe don't like you even try to make it work up to a certain extent. So I went like two or three months without really going to a standard barber. I was going to these different barbers uh, and each barber had its own unique experience. So I was like, Oh, what does that look like in the form of a short film? Um, mm -hmm. I had been on set with all American. I, I knew like the words of how to direct. I knew action. I knew cut. I knew like how to talk to the actors or whatnot. So just by being on set, just by osmosis, I was just like, Oh, I think I want to turn this into a short film. And caught on a lot of favors from from my people with All American, both like crew members and beyond. And we did, I think it was about a two or three day shoot. Learned a lot of lessons there. Um, I'm, I look at that short film now because I think it's about four or five years old now. And I'm like, oh man, like there's so many things I would have done differently in it. But mm -hmm. it gave me the confidence to say, you know, I want to direct more things. Um, yeah that came from all American, just again, being on set, being in the writer's room, learning the ebbs and flows of the story, uh, learning how to do reveals and all that type of stuff. Even, you know, going back to the music, knowing where to put music and where not to put music. 
uh, it all came from just the confidence in me doing that short film came from just being on set every single day, specifically yeah. that first season was all American. And then um, Panorama came out of one of our background football players on all American is the writer director of Panorama. So um, our first season, we had a background football player named Scotty Felix, who's a USC linebacker. He's USC's mm-hmm. first linebacker slash theater major. And he was always different. He was always just like that guy that was always off to the side playing with grass or just like meditating or just off thinking where when you get ex-football players together, it's a lot of testosterone. It's a lot of like yeah. <laughs> trying to relive the glory days or, or what have you. But Scott was just always off to the side. Um, he left the show after season one. I, we followed each other on Instagram. I had, I had seen he had been directing a few things like short spots, just creative endeavors. Uh, he was the head of Slauson Film Company, uh, which oh, cool. under the tutelage of like Shia LaBeouf and a couple other really dope people, uh, he was putting on plays in a routine basis. Uh, and I just saw like, oh, this guy's creative. I'm seeing the things he's putting on Instagram. It looks like really interesting. The colors are dope. The the messages are dope. Yeah. And about two years after following him, he DM me and was like, hey, I'd love to talk to you about something. So. Uh, we got on the Zoom, and he's like, I have this idea for a short film named Panorama. He gave me the rundown of it, sent me the materials and the script. And because I had seen what he was doing two years up to, you know, two years prior, I said yes, because I'm always from the standpoint of, I'm not going to help you if I don't already see you helping yourself. But if I yeah. see you helping yourself, if I can bring resources to get you where you want to go, I'm always down for the layup, the assist, or whatnot. You know, so... Came on to produce that with my producing partner, Dane Mork, under our Moore Street Productions banner. Um, we have Karima from the show, um, mm-hmm. Grace, for all those that don't know, yeah. from the show. She played she played the mother, and a lot of the, a lot of the background uh, actors in that short film came from All-American as well. And it's, it's just a really cool story about, you know, a man trying to find what's his sort of motivation in life after his mother passes away unexpectedly uh he kind of goes through this trip through the cosmos and ends up having this really lovely conversation with her where the intent of the film the theme of the film is love what's in front of you so essentially you know whether that's love your girlfriend whether that's love the actual future in front of you um and that film really allowed me to understand my producing capacity away from all american you know i can do my own short film with my own little bubble but how does that work now with me giving my resources and time to somebody else to make a good project? So I was able to bring a handful of actors onto the film. Uh, we had an influx of uh, like capital that got flushed with the film because of my involvement. And it just really allowed me to go, okay, like if I can do this producing thing, you know, full tilt. So since Panorama, we got to a handful of film festivals. We actually uh, recently just completed a short film called Leaves of Glass that was written and directed by Scott Felix as well. And we're turning oh, wow. that into a feature length film, uh, which we just landed a pretty big uh, up and coming talent as the lead actor for that. So nice. look out for Leaves of Glass, hopefully, uh, news about it at least, hopefully, uh, later this year. Definitely will. Definitely will. And I'm like sensing organically this thread of like very sort of like black male focused stories is that what you Hmm. look for in a story whether it's producing or writing or is is there any sort of um i'd say like thread that you see in the story types of stories that you want to tell yeah and and also like scott scott's a uh you know uh he's latino um Mm -hmm. and you know even his story is is based off of a panorama had a black male lead um, but Lisa Glass has a, a Latino lead, uh, okay, and it's cool. deeply rooted in Mexican folklore. But in terms yeah. of my blue line, like my my personal mission is, I, I would love to tell stories about exceptional black men in general. Um, yeah, you know, there's a there's a handful of stories that I'm shepherding right now, and that are out there in the world that I think the stories that I'm developing right now can get me to a point where I can confidently go and try to take those stories and, and tell yeah. them in, in a light that I would hopefully like to tell. Um, yeah. but for me, my through line is like, as a writer, I'm telling a lot from my experience. Um, I'm mm-hmm. telling a lot from like, obviously the black experience. Um, but as a producer, I'm from the mindset of 
I may not understand exactly what's coming from your culture or ethnicity or whatnot, but if I'm working with you and I think you know what you're talking about, mm-hmm. I'm down to put my resources behind what you are talking about. Got you it. Know, I don't know much about Mexican folklore, but sitting with Scott and, and feeling Scott's energy about the story he wants to tell, I'm like, I may not know exactly what you're talking about or the history of mm-hmm. it all or whatnot, but I know you know what you're talking about and that's yeah. what I want to get behind. So it's yeah. just, to me, it's, it's always collaborating with, with people that are self-starters, people that you don't need to hold their hand through things and people that have a unique perspective on the stories they want to tell. So yeah. if I could yeah. say anything, it's that it's, it's just getting behind creatives that have a unique POV that doesn't necessarily yeah. align with mine sometimes. That's really cool. And like you, like you were saying, sort of that like assist language, like I can, I can assist you. I can do the layup for you. That's really cool. Absolutely. Um, I love, I love a good assist. Yeah. That's awesome. I think obviously we're all, all American fans. The people that listen to this podcast are super, super enthusiastic, all American fans. How has this journey of season six been? I know that like you just said that you you all are like sort of wrapping up the season from a writing standpoint, but how has this journey been going, especially coming off of the strike uh, that stopped the industry for a very long time? Yeah, I mean, if you would have told me we would still be here after surviving COVID and a strike and potentially an impending strike coming up, um, Mm -hmm. I'd be like, are you, are you sure? Like, what Like what do you know that I don't? Like, not really believing you, you know? But yeah. this season has been, and I, I always go back to, to NK, uh, our showrunner, just putting the show on her back and willing it through. You know, she now has three TV shows on the air. Uh, I think she's second to, um, who did Scandal? Um, Shonda. Um, Shonda, yeah, she's like second to Shonda as like the only black woman to have multiple shows on the air at once. Um, right. If not for her, like if not for her, All American, in my opinion, gets canceled after its first, maybe second season. If, if not for NK, mm-hmm. you know, you don't see the sort of, like I said, that ecosystem come alive, um, and you don't see these actors, you know, turn into professionals through All American. Um, yeah. Surviving this, surviving both COVID and the strike uh, is something that is like a blessing because it just yeah. allowed us to get extremely creative in whether it's testing every day, whether it's like shortening scenes or, or you know, making people safe on set in terms of when COVID was going up and, and keeping everybody abreast when it came to updates with the strike making sure, you know, people are striking together. You know, even All-American, we had specific days where we would all go out together and pick it. Uh, and we yeah. used it as a time of reunion because, you know, that strike went on forever. And in the dead of summer, and people aren't working, and it, it, it's, we are still seeing the signs and of, of how the strike affected Hollywood. We're still recovering from that. But in yeah. those moments of NK pretty much, you know, you know, sending out the back signal, being like, everybody assemble over here, essentially. Um, it was amazing. It was amazing to see that yeah. we weren't just a family when everything was going well. You know, mm-hmm. we were a family when shit hit the fan. Um, yeah. And again, it's just, it's just a testament to the ecosystem, the family that NK has built. Uh, agreed. And like, very, very difficult industry changing times i'd say like three times over because it's like the regular change with the rise of streaming and then putting covid on top of that as like an international emergency and then putting Mm -hmm. the double strike uh with the writers and the and the actors and now yeah like you were saying like there's potential stuff with like the IATSE so like all of the crews that work on that work on the show so yeah it's been the, the, all American has lasted through some tough times <laughs> I mean not, not to mention time. like C, CW even went through a sale recently. right so, yeah like understanding like you know we are CW's number one show but there were months where we're holding our breath like is the new regime coming in and they're just chopping down this tree that's been built over the past five, six right. years, like what, is, what are they going to do to it? And to get that vote of confidence from them 
being the first show that they renewed or gave a series renewal to um, after months of not knowing was, you know, again, it was a gift. I still, to yeah. this day, I wake up and I'm like, I'll, 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 I'll be sitting, you know, at night flipping through Netflix and I'll see my face next to Tay's on the Netflix little icon. <laughs> right. I, I love it. You, like, you're your character of the, of the coach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just laugh. I'm just like, what is life? Like, what is like, yeah. how, how did this happen? And there's some like, you know, uh, survivor remorse with mm-hmm. that because, you know, you I have had such a great life. I've been able to accomplish my dream of getting to the NFL or getting a football scholarship and then making it to yeah. the national championship and then Super Bowl, NFL, the whole thing. So then to be able to walk away from one dream and step into another and, you know, the show become what it is, there's a lot of that of like, what was it about my story cause, or, or what have you to make this hit on so many different levels? Because me personally, I know so many football players, athletes in general, that whose stories would absolutely blow your mind. And it was part me being in the right position at the right time, part me learning how to screenwrite to when I yeah. got an opportunity to write the initial document that created All-American. I had already knew how to take you on those ebbs and flows of a story to kind of hook you in. But it was just thinking of all those things that fell into place for all American, yeah. all American to become what it is and still knowing, you know, there's God still on the other side of that. There's luck on exactly. the other side of that. Like, yeah, it's still mind blowing. Yeah. To that, to- and like you said, it, I, I think it was like the right group of people be that, like the right, like NK, you know, coming in um, as well. Cause I think that she was originally brought on as like initially it consult it if i'm like she'd like to call consult on the series no, and she, was she a writer. became more involved yeah she was a she a lot of people don't realize this but she she was uh you know so april blair was our showrunner uh for the first season but a lot of people don't realize it but april blair um stepped away from the show the week we were, were like premiering you know you know october the week of october 10th 2018 april blair stepped away from the show nk was a writer on the show and when you walked into that room for the first time, you knew NK was the best writer in that room. She just zooted it. Her 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 comments on other people's story pitching was great. Her story pitches were great. The writing was just keen. And when April stepped away from the show and Greg promoted NK to that position, you could tell the entire office was like, "Yeah, she's going to do this right because she's going to captain she was this ship yeah. built for the moment." Yeah, she. It was just like this is her show, and mm-hmm. the stars aligned for for it to become her show. Because, like I said before, without her in the driver's seat of this, this does not get to six seasons. It does not get to hundred episodes. I'm probably yeah. not here talking to you today if NK doesn't take it and run with it. Yeah, that's amazing. Like hats off, hats off to her. And it's it's for me, it's great like hearing this, and I think for the fans of the show it'll be great hearing this because i think like everybody has Mm -hmm. their like opinions on storylines and whatever have you everybody has an opinion on storylines i mean i have a whole podcast about opinions (laughs) on storylines and things like that but to understand i think the position that she's in uh as a black woman in hollywood and like accomplishing all of it she has and like you said like creating that ecosystem of course with the support of you all but like creating that ecosystem it's an amazing testament to who she is as a person and like her reputation throughout just like the all American set. And also just like throughout, I think uh, like Hollywood in general, black Hollywood in general, uh, that she has this amazing reputation and this amazing sort of work ethic to do and accomplish all of the things that she's done. So it's really cool for me to hear. Oh, it's yeah. What what you see with her is what you get. Like I've never met somebody that, she knows how to grind harder than anybody I've yeah. ever come across. Like you're talking about somebody that she could write in a closet if she has like three square feet to open up her <laughs> laptop. Like I've and I've seen it. I've seen her doing yeah. it. I've seen her yeah. wielding three shows into existence um, and still have enough time to like dance in her office whenever she gets a good mm-hmm. email or somebody yeah. stops by and say hi. You know so. Um, NK is like somebody like 
you just always have those people who you always pick up their phone call whenever they call or if they say, hey, mm-hmm. I need you for something, I'm there in a snap. So yeah. she'll always have that, that with me. All right, I have a couple more questions for you, and then I'll, I'll let you go because I know your time scheduled for an hour. Um, how is it – I know we've talked about, like, season six and, you know, the amazing accomplishment that season six and 100 episodes has been – how do you view the character of Spencer James and like his relationship to you? Has it stayed the same in some ways? Is it like, I know it's evolved, but like in what yeah. ways do you view that and like the evolution of the Spencer James character in relation to who you are in real life? Oh man, me, me and Spencer James. And I'm not saying like me and Daniel, I'm saying me and Spencer James. I'm saying this. Yeah, fiction yeah exactly. Version. I'm glad that you made that distinction. Yeah. Spills off of me. I, I'm not, I'm not over here talking about Daniel. Like me and Daniel, that's my my dog. Me and Spencer James have had such a crazy what the hell relationship because mm-hmm. you know initially this this fictitious version of me, you know, coming into the industry, learning how I learned, uh, it was again trial by fire. I'm learning everything, like new things every single day, and story structure and everything. So you know, those first initial drafts where the story, like, a little bit deviated from my story, I'm sitting here like, well, why is Spencer doing this? I wouldn't do this. Like, what's going on? Yeah. Understanding that Spencer James has to be a different person than me to be able to relate to so many different people. So, mm-hmm. you know, my, my, my DMs are filled with, you know, teenage girls asking me, like, who's your wife in real life? Yeah. And then I have, like, 60 year old men like hey man this football could be a little bit better or i like this one scene so it's like exactly the fact that you the fact that i get so many different buckets of people that are all watching the show that are engaged with the show it to me it's because spencer spencer james see i'm messing it up it's because spencer james (laughs) represents a a energy in america and the world right now of sort of the millennial i mean the the gen z black sport experience in america yeah um spencer james has gone through a ton of things i haven't gone through we've gone through a lot of things together um Mm -hmm. at one point i realized spencer james was actually like effectively changing my history my real life history to the point where Mm -hmm. i started believing my history wasn't as good because the world would rather see this history you know play out Mm -hmm. so you know there was some moments where like i would side eye spencer spencer james because i'm like oh man i feel like you're you're making me insecure about my own history you know yeah uh but then it just got to yeah and but that all came at the time where you know i'm I'm leaving the nfl i'm entering this space i'm i'm extremely vulnerable i don't know if this is going to catch fire or not I have a daughter, a, like a six, seven month old daughter at this at this time. I've only been married for about a year, year and a half. We just bought a home. Like there was so much change happening in my life that now I'm looking at, you know, a fictitious embodiment of my history being fictionalized. It threw me for a loop, you know, and I, I found a lot of grace with that, you know, going finally like getting back into therapy and 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 talking mm-hmm. those problems out and issues out and whatnot to the point now where I look at Spencer James it's like yo you needed to exist for this in this moment in time not only for me but for sort of athletes for young black men for the yeah. TV space in general like Spencer James and the cast needed to exist because when we were creating the show you know me and my producing partner Dan Morf we always said if we do this right this will be the next great teen drama, like 90210, any given, I mean, not any given Sunday, uh, Friday Night Lights, right. Tree Hill, like those type of shows. Like, we do this right, we can do it, but this will have a predominantly black class. It mm-hmm. will have a predominantly, like, we will be in South Central just as much as we're in Beverly Hills, which is, like, arguably never really been done before. So, right. To have that relationship with Spencer James, I can now, like, I smile at him. I love Spencer James. I'm like, you did it. You kind of proved everybody wrong. You know, you you were the you were leading the show that shouldn't really have succeeded at the time it came out, considering what the market was interested in. But yeah. it was just that little show that could that just became a monster. 
yeah in, in the best way <laughs> yeah it was like it, i i like to think about it as like almost like a delayed lightning strike like the lightning struck the bottle analogy but it was like it took a second because yeah. it was like the the lightning was almost like netflix when it, it when it went on netflix and then it was saved it was like oh wait there's a huge huge audience and one of the things that i think that yeah. i admire in k4 is leaning into the family aspect of the show uh because mm -hmm. i think it was one of the first shows in a while where like i could talk about it with my mom or my aunts and like yeah. they were just ex as excited about this show as i was uh and so it was a cool sort of like intergenerational intergenerational yeah. element to this show that i don't think like other teen dramas had that i think that like this the the writing staff and the, and the cast and just their performances really leaned into so i love that yeah i think that's that's always like those are always the best emails or texts or whatever it's just like you know i've had friends and mentors that have said i've had these like tough conversations i don't want to have with my kid but it wasn't until we sat down to watch all american that they came up organically in the show that I would mm -hmm. pause it and look to my like 14, 15 year old son and be like, yo, do you feel this way? What's going on in your life? And, you know, their son or daughter is like, well, actually, since you were talking about it, and it's allowed so many different conversations to open up across generations. Yeah. Um, those those yeah. are always the best, the best texts, DMs, emails. Like my, my friend who's in, uh, he's traveling in Ghana right now. And mm -hmm. he's in, I forget the part that he mentioned, but he was like, oh, this is like the Beverly Hills of Ghana. And they yeah. were like, oh, we know Ghana. I mean, we know Beverly Hills from All American. Like, we watch All American. <laughs> That's and amazing. He's like having this conversation about, he's like, oh, I know the real Spencer. And they're like, what is going on? So <laughs> it's just cool to see that All American is yeah. like literally populating the world um, yeah. with these stories about, you know, this kid from South Central. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And this season, we're exploring him actually right G getting closer to his dream of the nfl and i know that yeah nk and the cast and all of the interviews that have come out so far have mentioned that this season is really about almost like resetting to that original dream that spencer had and like spencer and jordan are gearing up potentially for the nfl draft what are your thoughts on that and that it's like it's taken six seasons but we're finally sort of like on our way to to spencer and potentially jordan as well being being drafted to the nfl yeah, you know, it's 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 a dream realized, you know. Um, yeah. And it, when I say that, it's it's the dream of me going. I wish if this show gets going, it can do some good. If we can mm -hmm. tell Spencer James's story in its entirety, it will do some good. So the dream realized is, oh shit, we got here. You know, yeah. this this was a bunch of. This was this started as a bunch of back and forth emails with like Berlanti's team that turned into a pilot, that turned into a first season, that you know didn't get the vote of confidence that we would come back into for season two until Netflix, you know, got a hold of it yeah. and made it their number one show on the platform. Um, so it's just like season six being the you know not the culmination of the story, but right. the stamp of like there's a clear line from point A to point B now that yeah. we can show and, and can live forever is, is, is still insane to think about, you know, Spencer, yeah. you know, finally getting to that point where, you know, he may or may not be touching the NFL, you know, what does yeah. that look like for him? Like there's a, there's a lot of hurdles that we're, that we're, we're putting the entire cast through this season mm -hmm. um, that I think can, can really bring us back to like a really dope point in, sort of a linear story of Spencer's dream of getting to the NFL. So yeah. it's going to be exciting. There's, 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 it a, lot is. Of, there's a lot of, lot of cool, cool moments. And I, I'm being very specific with my words because I don't want to give anything away. I know, I know. But and I was I just like, I, this is the, the, the tough part because I'm like, I don't want you to spoil anything or like, I, you know, whatever. Um, but I also yeah. do want to ask if you can share what are you most excited about for season six, especially because I, I, I do want to reiterate and emphasize that like all American is joining the pantheon of it's not that many shows 
that in the world in existence that have reached 100 episodes truly uh and i think that is mm-hmm. again a testament to the quality of the show and like all of the hard work that you all put into it and so it's joining the pantheon of great shows right that have reached 100 and ep- 100 episodes uh and they're doing this in season six i believe it's going to be 609 is the is the 100th episode exactly um, but how, if you can share, what are you most excited about in season six, rounding out this hundred episodes and like joining like all of these like great TV shows in history? Yeah, I think one of one of the through lines with you know all the characters really is there's there's various moments of growth that every storyline has had throughout the show and that every uh, character has had throughout the show but i feel like this is sort of that first season where you're really you're, like, you're starting to see some adult decisions being made you know yeah like, we're not we're not dealing with high schools anymore we're not dealing with you know first year college football players and stuff you're dealing with people that understand their strengths and weaknesses within their world that are starting to realize the world is as big as they want to make it um, and are starting to like wield their power in directions that they want to take their lives. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think what's, what's going to be a really cool through line throughout the entire se- uh, season six is seeing the directions that all these characters want to take their lives, not out of a, not out of a, like being a passenger you know, in their own life or, you know, sitting by waiting idle on what's to happen. Like there's a lot, a lot of our storylines is like, these are people going out and getting what they want. They're going out mm-hmm. and, and taking their slice of life and creating their slice of life in the image that they wanted. So um, I think that's going to be a, a, a really cool through line throughout season six is you're, you're going to start seeing our cast kind of create the lives that they want. I love that. I love that. That's really cool. And the, to that point, yeah, they're, they're adults. There's just some messy stuff in the high school years, but messy I'm stuff. excited. I'm excited to see, again, like, Jordan is a character in particular that I always think about because he's, I think, was very immature when we first met him. And seeing how mm-hmm. he's gotten more mature, I think he's a character that has gone on, like, such an interesting journey, Asher, as well. Uh, so, yeah, there's just a lot of a lot of characters that I'm excited to see how they handle how they handle being adults uh and like stepping into like you said like their their slice of life (laughs) yeah i think even like specifically for like asher's story like Mm -hmm. every character's gone through so much but when you look at asher's story i'm like man you got the you got the kitchen sink thrown at you you yeah a bunch (laughs) of different ways so definitely the you know specifically with asher I, i think we have some really cool stuff lined up for him this season to where you know we get to pay off a lot of a lot of past storylines and energy in general um yeah and really give him a a you know just just a nice appreciation season yeah. mm. cool awesome any anything with layla olivia i mean those, those are the girls you know those are those are those are the staples you know i know I, <laughs> They always take care of business, so that's what I'm like. Oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're that's why good. I'm like, you ain't, you ain't, listen, you ain't never got to worry about Layla and Olivia handling business because <laughs> they they go after and get it. They, they, they do. They go get it, so I they just do. think, again, back to what I was saying of, like, Layla steps into her own, you know, she takes mm-hmm. command in a few different ways this season, you know, live as well. Um, yeah. It's... Uh, I wish I could just like we could just start dishing on what's happening, but I'm not gonna hope. <laughs> but I'm so proud to live. I'm so proud to live, and just yeah, all that she's like the fact that she stayed in London for a long time. So I so we know yeah. we know a little bit because they revealed a little bit with the the synopsis and stuff like that. But yeah, mm-hmm. I'm really excited, like you said, for all of these characters, uh, yeah. just to see how they handle these these adult situations now and decisions mm-hmm. that they have to make. So it'll be exciting. Thank you so much for joining and talking. And it, it was crazy the way it worked out that like we met. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you for taking the time. Uh, and then as I was sick, like being so easy and willing to like reschedule and everything. And 
yeah i just like tell the people what anything you want the people to know before we before we hop off um well I'll, i want to say did you ever tell did you ever tell uh the listeners like how you found the film study name <gasps> listen okay so i actually was upset like i've always been obsessed with football and so i came up with the name but then i figured out when i was doing my research yeah. like on <laughs> other podcasts that you also had a podcast called film study and it was a similar yeah. mine was like specifically focused on all american but yours i think was just in general film study and as mm-hmm. a like play on the name mm-hmm. uh but that you have a podcast or had a podcast at one point called film study which was so cool and i was just like do i do i have your blessing to take the name yeah that was that was crazy because uh <laughs> our film our podcast uh, we pitched it to lebron's company uninterrupted and we named it film study because we we, me and my producing partner who co-hosted it with me, we wanted to talk to athletes about what, what movies they grew up watching, TV yeah. shows that changed their life, perspectives on whatnot, what they're watching now, all this type of stuff. So we, we did the podcast for about four or five months with Uninterrupted. And it just got to the point where like we just had a lot of creative differences. Like I wanted to take the show and keep yeah. it more like nuanced, whereas they wanted to make it more broad. Um, and so we, we shelved it for a little bit. And you, I think you, you either DM me or you tweeted me like, do you mind if I take the film study game? And at this time, yeah. I was so done with the, the idea of the show. I was like, yeah, take it and run with it. It's yours. <laughs> uh, so I like, gave you like an unofficial blessing. And then ironically, like last year. Is it coming back? <laughs> me. No. Well, me, me and uh, me and my producing partner, we were in talks with the company to bring it back, but mm-hmm. you know, potentially under a different name. So we. Literally, we spent like six months trying to think of a, another name that can like lend itself to film study. And at one point, the company was like, why don't you just go take film study back from her? And I was like, no, like we gave it to her. Like we can't, we have to think of another one. I'm not going to be I'm like, I'm not going to be an ass and like be like, nope, take it back. Like, no. So we literally, yeah. we, we broke down communications on bringing down that podcast because one, one of the factors was like, I would not just take the name back so that's so cool the podcast is like still not happening but i was just like they were like multiple times they were like you guys can just take the name back and i'm like that's no, so funny. i cannot take the name back like i you like, could have just I, like put a little like a little uh what is it called like a colon yeah. like <laughs> i appreciate that i appreciate so, that I mean, there are other things that made it there are other things that made it break down other things yeah. that made it break down but like I remember them asking it and it was just like, I'm not taking a podcast name from somebody. I'm not mm-hmm. taking your back at that. So I appreciate uh, you, I you having my back I, on I, that. I you. <laughs> <laughs> you really have my back. I didn't even know. I love there you that. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, in general, um, no, I, to anybody listening to this, thank you so much for watching all American. Um, it, the, the show has changed my life. It's, changed every person that's ever touched that show both cast crew and beyond's life um for us to get to 100 episodes is is no easy feat to survive a pandemic a strike multiple strikes and the sell of a network and still kind of be here chugging along is astronomical uh, but it's yeah. to the fans that that tuned in whether weekly whether on streaming or found it on netflix whenever we go up on there so um Thank you guys for rocking with our show. You know, we're, we're not done yet. We still have a lot more story to tell. Um, me personally, this was my intro into the industry, um, writing and developing a bunch of other bunch of other TV shows, both in sports and beyond. But if not for All American, I would not be able to step into the rooms I'm able to step into now. Um, so again, it, it all starts with all of you, you know, looking at that show title, reading a little bit about it and going, all right, I'm going to press play on this. Um, so thank you for the ride. And again, we, we still have some twists and turns for you. <laughs> Excited to see what's happening with All-American and, and Homecoming when it comes back. And just like for everything that you're doing, uh, on the, the, like with the projects that you're producing and the projects you're writing. So looking forward to that. Also wanted to know, I'm a huge fan of Hilltop. So if y'all are ever in LA, go visit oh, Hilltop. <laughs> It has Thank really you. good I'm food. A yeah, really good food. The cornbread a, and the chili. It's a cornbread. There we go. So you know what to order. You know what to order. Yeah, we have, we I have got five you. locations in LA. 
five locations in LA. Um, if you guys are ever in LA or, or living in whatnot, um, you're probably nearby a location. So we're, we're, we're building up more locations over the next couple of years. But you know, Issa Rae is, is one of our co-founders of it. Um, she's put it in a lot of her TV shows and, and, and whatnot. So just trying to bring really dope food options to with a predominantly black aesthetic um, to the world. So if you guys are in LA, come check it out. Definitely, definitely. Awesome. All right. Thank you all for listening to this episode and uh, see you see you with season six. Yes. <laughs>